There we go. All right. Welcome to this Zoom interview. My name is Stacy. I'm the manager of Workspace. Workspace is owned and operated by the town of Manchester, Connecticut. We are a co-working meeting and gallery space with multiple missions. We're here to support small business growth, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and artists who are also entrepreneurs, um, have personal and professional success by giving um, hospitable, flexible, affordable space to do their work. Um, also networking opportunities, business development opportunities, and um, introductions to people who can help them, to peers, to build their social and professional capital. We're also interested, since we are in a historic building in downtown Manchester, of drawing business and people to downtown and Main Street. Uh, we were open this past Saturday for our Juneteenth art exhibit and had over 75 people come through the gallery, had an art project for little kids, had over a dozen artists here um, out of the 20 some odd artists who are in the exhibit. So they got to meet each other and share ideas and resources and just appreciation for art. We consider theater obviously to be part of um, art and the world of culture that brings people together, that stimulates conversation, that entertains and deals with um, serious issues. And the Little Theater of Manchester here in town uh, at Cheney Hall is currently putting on a production of Walter Cron Cronkite is Dead, which happens to have been written by someone I went to college with, Joe Calarco, who is the subject of our uh, conversation today. So I'm going to talk to him first about his life as an entrepreneur in the art world, uh, working freelance, taking gigs, um, finding these opportunities and optimizing them and the relationships you have to build uh, to be an entrepreneur. Many people think they want to be an entrepreneur because they want to work alone, uh, but I believe Joe will uh, back me up and that's not how you build a career. And then we have some people from uh, the Little Theater of Manchester involved in this current production who might want to pick his brain or share anecdotes about the actual script and producing it. Um, and obviously COVID is still a thing. Uh, so that plays into this production as does the um, the idea of different people coming together with different life experience and different ideas and how we can find commonality. So that's a lot to cover in less than an hour, but we're gonna get started. Hi, Joe. Hey, Stacy. <laughs> so you've done a lot of these interviews recently. I have, I mean, I, COVID I think has, has beefed up the sort of, um, you know, this kind of game <laughs> of interviews and podcasts and Zoom podcasts, et cetera. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with some basic questions that you might've been asked many times. So I apologize for the redundancy, but it's new All to good. the audience. Um, and I'm curious, vocationally, I'm a life coach. So I work with people to help them. I generate a vision of, you know, who they wanna be and what type of career they wanna be. And I'm curious for you, what did you have in mind when you and I were at Ithaca College six or seven years ago? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in that. Um, what was your definition of success in this field? Well, uh, Ithaca really changed my entire career and life. I mean, I, I had gone to school, dropped out, then took two and a half years off. I really ended up at Ithaca because I was visiting a friend, uh, Angie Hannon, and um, and just fell in love with the department and the work I was seeing and the town itself. And so, well, let me um, apply. And I got in. And I mean, my original degree, uh, I was originally there for musical theater. Part of my time in those two and a half years was to move to New York. And I was like, if I'm, and even though technically Ithaca is not a conservatory, the musical theater program is like a conservatory program. You basically take nothing outside of the major or very little. And I thought if I'm just going to take theater, I could have just stayed in New York. So, and I wanted a broader education. So I switched to acting, which still allowed me to take voice lessons and as audit dance classes. And, um, and really what happened is this now will age us properly. 
the summer before our junior year, um, Tiananmen Square happened, and then our junior year, the wall came down, and the Berlin Wall came down, and um, that was like major world history. Like, it, and we were doing anything goes at the time, and it just seemed silly to be tap dancing on a big stage in an expensive private school in upstate New York, when really like the History Channel timeline history was happening. And so I went to my advisor, Susanna Berriman, and was like, I have to drop out of school. I have to go to Berlin. I have to dance on the wall. I didn't know how financially I was going to do this. But, um, and she said, you don't have to drop out of school. She said, you should pick a play that says something about the world you live in and direct it. Now I had, I grew up in Rochester, New York. I directed a couple of musicals when I was a teenager. There's a, a student was a student run musical theater summer program. Uh, and so this is my first play and I picked a play called Beirut, which was a very controversial play in the eighties. Um, and so I pitched that and it was done and it had a big impact on campus. Um, and people, it seemed to really impact people individually. Like I would run into people or people would come up to me after the show and and it was a simple log line of what Beirut was about. Uh, it set a little bit into the future and low, the Lower East Side of New York is a quarantine zone and called, they call it Beirut. Um, and there's a disease that is um, transmitted not only sexually, but by tears and sweat, which was why in some ways in the eighties, it was very controversial because obviously people were thinking of it as AIDS. And so they felt it was disseminating dangerous information which you know it was a metaphor and brilliant and um uh and um and i just thought well look i actually as a director have more control over what i talk about um or can hopefully and it really just was so satisfying to me like i always thought well i want to be a performer and um but it was suddenly so much about so much more than like being successful or being famous or all that jazz. And so it really did change my life. And so I then went to New York. I was still auditioning, but um, it just set me on a different path. Also my senior year at Ithaca, I wrote my first play. Um, I mean, I was always a writer sort of creatively, but I'd never written a play. And an event happened on our campus um, where uh, in the, the the two towers on campus were the, these, you know, looming towers over a parking lot. And on a Thursday night at 11 p.m., some Cornell students had driven some Ithaca College students back after a party. And one of them was beaten to death in the parking lot and no one saw anything. And I was like, at 11 o'clock on a Thursday night on any college campus anywhere, but in that parking lot. So I wrote I a play. A, I was a residence director in yes. residence assistant, an RA in that tower. Okay. Where it happened. And so anyway, I wrote a play called Isolated Incidents about that, all in different sort of uh, college dorm rooms that overlooked this. And most of it takes place before it happens. And then, anyway, so I wrote my first play and directed my first play our senior year there. And it completely changed sort of my right. passion for the industry and what I felt I wanted to do and made me more entrepreneurial in a way, because it really is about generating your own work in a different way, so. Excellent. And as a writer, director, dramaturg, do you see yourself as wearing many different hats as an entrepreneur, or is it just one big chapeau? No, it's, it's different things in terms of what you're, I mean, I've always been a dramaturg, which has a lot of different definitions, but in terms of really dealing with text of a new work. I've always considered myself a dramaturgical director. Like I think it's part of the job. I mean, not everyone does it or, and that's fine. I just tend to do it. I think it came from the fact that I'm also a writer. So the two things influence me greatly, um, my work greatly. And now I've started dramaturging other people's work that I don't direct, which I actually love. It's kind of nice to be completely not attached to it at all. You have a different point of view. So um, they're just different things um, in terms of, I mean, right now, I mean, I have not directed a show from let's audition a show 
let's rehearse it for a month and let's do it live since June of 2019 because I was working down at Signature Theater in DC on staff for about four and a half years. I left there in May of 2019, went immediately to the Berkshires, directed into the woods. And then I had planned to move back to New York and I was like, well, I'm not gonna move back to New York in July or August. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll go to Ithaca. I often will go to Ithaca for the summer. I used to go more. And I thought, I'll go to Ithaca for the summer and just sort of write and sojourn. And so I was there really to the end of August and then moved back to New York. In the fall, I went to Aspen to direct a reading of a play, like a net, you know, music stands reading. And then I doctored a show off Broadway in December, January, and then the pandemic hit. I've now since directed a couple readings online, but I haven't been in the full rehearsal process in two years, over two years now. Wow. Exactly two years. And what have you been doing with that time creating? Writing, writing, which has been great. And I have to say, like I have four, with Winter Break, which is my, which was published in the middle of the pandemic, I have 14 published plays. But up and really until the pandemic, I so respect writers and it would be hard for me to call myself a writer, which is I know insane and weird and, um, but because in many ways directing, each of them made a difference. If I didn't do both, I would not, I've made my living now for 22 years only working in the theater, which I know is very rare. And I you know, don't have to do other things or even teach, which is amazing. Um, so they make the difference, but directing really was the thing that was getting sort of paychecks in. I mean, I get royalties from the published plays, um, but it's not like if R and J, which is my foreman Romeo and Juliet, is over to, done overseas, those are big checks. But I was always doing both, and in some ways, writing was when I could fit it in while I was directing, mm -hmm. and I had commissions while I'm in the middle of directing like a major musical. So. It's been nice to just have the time to just write. I mean, I kind of really dig the schedule, to be honest. Um, so, can, so can you comfortably call yourself a writer now? Oh, yes. Now I'm full on. And this question's in, in I will now hashtag playwright, playwrights of Instagram completely without any hesitation. So, um, and what did it take for you to start valuing your work? Um, I know for our art gallery, for example, we have artists, it's their first time being in our art gallery. Others are professional artists. Pricing their work is really challenging for people. Um, and some people have a theory. It's, well, what is the material plus the time? Yeah. Um, others, it's like, well, how much do I personally love it and not yeah. get it walk out the door? So how do you how did you get to a point where you could comfortably charge the, the going rate of people with your experience and your awards and yeah well the theater is a very weird industry in terms of pay <laughs> it just is I mean as a director and, and then this is nothing against producers that this is how contractually it's done but like when you know you're doing a lot of pre I do think producers commercial producers in their mind they're saying we're paying for when you're in the studio but guess what? Most of my work as a director is done before I walk in the studio. The vast majority of it is done. Rehearsal is the fun part to me. Um, so it's a weird, you know, it is a little bit of a weird kind of um, industry in that way. And in writing too, you're doing all you're doing all this work, hoping it'll get published and um, pay you back some money, but it's a little tricky. The, in some ways, dramaturgy was the, the thing that really um, at the time sort of struck me as my agent at the time, I was asked to do a gig and she said, well, I'm asking for $125 an hour with the two hour minimum. I was like, $150 an hour with two hour minimum. It's like, okay, and we got it. <laughs> it's like fabulous. So, I mean, and that rate, depending on who it is, that was a major commercial producer changes, but that really did show me like, no, you should get paid for your work. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so it was a combo of, of all of that. I mean, it was a combo of, that was a big thing for me to make money that I thought was insane to get. And it's not, I mean, it's not at all. And it's weird to say it now. Um, 
Uh, and then also, again, just writing so much now, it's made me I'm like, oh, I do this. This is what I do and I'm good at it and I'm published and like people like the work. So, you know. <laughs> and at what point in your career did you start hiring people to help you, either assistants, agents, managers? Well, agent was, I mean, this was right away in terms of, and this was the funny thing is when R&J opened off, off Broadway, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a lawyer or nothing. And then they wanted to move it off Broadway and I didn't have an agent. Luckily, I'd reached out to a couple, no response. And another college friend of ours, Caroline McMahon, mm -hmm. a friend of hers was the assistant to a, and the head of an agency, a major agency. And she said to me, oh, she came to see it. And I said, can you give me her contact info? And I just emailed her and said, hey, I don't even know if you like the show, but I need an agent to do this deal. Um, which was, a, you know, which again, that show was my calling card. Financially, that deal was ridiculously bad. I mean, ridiculously bad. It's paid off in the end, but um, you, I, it's shot. If you heard what I got paid, you'd be shocked. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it, let me let me stop you there. So you actually had the deal was done. You had an agreement to move an existing show to Broadway. You just needed the it was off Broadway. They, off no, Broadway. they wanted to move it, and I was not going to go without saying I need an agent or a lawyer right. looking at this. And you still I know, get agents to return your call, even though you're guaranteeing them. Well, the initial emails went out to just say, will you come see the show? I okay. have the show running, you know, yeah. off, off Broadway. So, um, and then I got a lawyer, I have both. And I mean, there was a period of time when I left one of my agents that I just had my lawyer. If you have both in entertainment, your agent gets 10%, your lawyer gets five. If you just have your lawyer, then they take the 10. And so I have both now. And I love having both because I like someone who's legal, is just looking at it from a purely legal standpoint. And it's not about this sort of family quality of the theater, which I'm, I'm all for, but it's a weird thing in terms of yeah. the kind of camaraderie of the theater. And yet it is a business. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the artists um, don't see this, are, are were treated as, family, then it's treated as business and we're sort of at times looked at strangely if we want to look at it as the business when we're looking at the business side of it. So yeah, and not many, not a lot of artists have are strongly skilled in both those areas, the creative side. Yes. But, and maybe schools are doing it, but it should be required now, like that whatever those TAM theater arts management classes are, it should be required for anyone who's going into the theater, like in any discipline. Right. I think it should be required to graduate. Just like medical school, bedside manner should be required. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> what, what else did you take in college? You mentioned you wanted to uh, diversify. Oh, like art history. And I took some social justice classes. And that's a whole other conversation in terms of, you know, living in a, you know, growing up in this city, this, you know, that's liberal to some degree, but. Anyway, well, that's a separate conversation. <laughs> so um, bringing it back to uh, Connecticut here, you were working with the Goodspeed on a yes. so-called LMNOP. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that kind of has a social justice. Yeah, I've actually done two shows with them, LMNOP and The Circus in Winter, which, which I directed there. I've now actually, I just posted about it on social media yesterday. I've now taken over the book writing of it and will not direct it. I said, if I'm doing the book, I actually, even, this is an interesting thing. I used to direct my own plays. Um, I'm, I now don't really want to direct my own, play. I think plays, I think musicals are different. I think it's, you have a, a larger team. There's a way to have more distance. Um, I did not want to direct Walter Cronkite is Dead, the premiere. Uh, Cause I just was like, it'd be good to have someone else direct it, except I wrote it for two very specific actresses at that point. And I wanted to make sure they did it. I wrote it on them. Um, and everyone expected it, the theater expected me to do it. And it was fine and it was great. But um, so musicals, I think you, 
you can do. I mean, I think there are directors who do both all the time and I think it's absolutely doable. I would just rather with plays not do it really. With musicals, I will, but this one, just because partly the subject matter and it's so big, I'm like, someone else, I think someone else should direct it. A woman needs to direct this, please. Um, so, uh, LMNOP is an amazing musical and I wish it actually, I mean, it's published now, which is great, so people should do it. It's based on a, a, a novel of this, this island that has this saying in the town square, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And it's a sort of utopian world and letters start falling off. And they decide it's a sign from their original founder that they should stop using those letters. Um, the main character, her name is Ella Minnow P. But in the end, and people are banished and she's really the only one left at the end. It ends up being a huge sort of government conspiracy, but um, what she's left with is LMNOP. Um, it's a brilliant mm -hmm. show because the book writer, lyricist, had to stop using letters as he went. It's genius. I mean, it really is genius. And we did it there and then we actually did it in Houston at Tuts. Uh, I love the piece so much. And we actually developed it at, um, with other Ithaca College students, because I started a theater company with Jen Waldman and Wendy Dan and Steve Pasek, who we went to college with at different times. Um, and we actually did development on LMNOP, which is how Goodspeed saw it. And then that's how they saw it. They came to the reading presentation mm -hmm. and then they said, well, we want to do it. So. Yeah. So how theater people, pardon the expression, um, work very intensely with the people they're working with on a project and then it's over and you move on and sustaining these close relationships is impossible because it's so intense when you're doing it and then you have so many of them. So what is it about the people that have stuck with you through this time as collaborators and, and supporters? Um, well, it takes work on all sides. I mean, I'm not always, I've not always been great at it of like, I mean, there are certain people I've worked on shows, directed their pieces for a year. I mean, and you move on and do different things, it's, but it really is all about relationships. And I say that I will go back, not only to Ithaca, but we talk to college students all the time and say, it's all about that. As a director, certainly, I don't think I've ever gotten a job via an agent as a director ever. And I've been an agent for 22 years. I've gotten some introductions, but most of it comes via relationships or taking the risk and reaching out yourself to someone. And now it's in a way, not that it's inexcusable, that sounds negative, but like you can reach people because of social media, it's easy mm -hmm. to find people. And I will also say to people, when I was, you know, director of new works down in Virginia, and I did the talk back for the drama skills, and I said, look, the email to send me is not, oh, I have a show, will you read it? It just reached out to me and say, hey, I'd love to meet you, can we have coffee? Because it's all about that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always said this too, like, if I know you, if you're an actor, it gets you an audition, and if all the other things are equal, it gets you the part. I've never you know, given, unless I've written it for them or something, but I've never in an audition situation, if someone, the best person gets a job. And um, I am same with writers. If I if I'm, was in that job reading scripts, if I know you, it impacts where you are in the pile to read. It just does. I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, and again, it doesn't guarantee you're gonna get it, but it's just, oh, I know them. I'm, well, I'm gonna read their new work. Um, and I've actually would say this to people too, is when we would do, and this is for me, I'm not speaking for others, but when we would do open submissions for musicals with this one program I started down there, I would get submissions from friends. And I would say, I was like, you know, you, you can text me and just say, hey, I'm submitting, be on the lookout for it. I mean, I say this to actors all the time. Like when I do mock auditions, it's, this is at Ithaca, and if they went to Ithaca, and I'll say, if because this happened to me, I was directing a show for Disney on one of their ships, and I don't look at resumes until 
you've done everything and I think you're great. And, and Disney's different because they're, they're casting six different shows. And, um, but someone came in from Ithaca who I really liked, but the argument was, well, we need her in this other, on this other ship. If I had looked at the resume and seen she went to Ithaca, but she, I, and I said to her, I was like, I wish she would said, hey, mm -hmm. I'm an IC buddy, or Susanna says hi. I say that students at the all the time. Just you know, ask a student teacher if if I go in for Joe, can I say you say hi? Because it just changes my view. Not again, it doesn't get you the job, but I'm a little more like there's a kind of oh, there's a fami familiarity to it. Yeah, and I kind of, I mean, I say this all the time to actors. I know whether I want you to be good before you started. And that has nothing to do with whether you say anything to me, but just walking in the it's it's about aura, it's about so many things. Um, but that's an extra, like, oh, I, if you went to Ithaca, I want you to be good. Of course I want you to be good. <laughs> so it doesn't mean I'm going to hire you, but it's just- Yeah, changing. you're already a little bit invested in their- Yes, exactly. Um, and, and I know I, people don't like to do that and it's hard to, again, and I'm, I battle with myself with it all the time too. I've told this story many times and I won't tell the full thing. But the only reason we're having this conversation is because with RNJ, I called the New York Times to ask to speak to the critic who reviewed RNJ off of Broadway. And he called me back. And when I said, we're, when is it coming out? He's like, it's coming out the day after you close. I said, oh, it's too bad we'd stay open if it was a good mention. And he took a pause and then said, stay open, which was ridiculously generous and changed my life. The show would not have stayed open we would not be talking because that show gave me a career. The phone call gave me a career. And yeah, I listened to one of your podcasts. Down, but... I have it written down in my notes that the advice you give is pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. And again, I'm not always good at it. It's yeah. a hard, hard thing to do, but yeah. In any business, you just, you just don't know. And again, you're not asking anybody to extend themselves egregiously. Yes. Um, and when people give you advice, when they're nice to you and then you succeed, it's a feather in their cap. Yes. And so oh, they just I, feel good. Yeah. I mean, you just feel good about it. Like, you know. And then write a thank you note afterwards. You yes. Know, you in some way. That's um, a big thing. That isn't yeah. fun. <laughs> you know, so. LinkedIn and Facebook, you can, you know, share. Yes. What you think they might like is another positive way. Yeah. Um, networking. You're not always asking for things. No, exactly. Very cool. So I'm going to ask you one more question before opening it up to yes. the little panel. They can uh, introduce themselves. Um, we didn't talk much about your, your big break with R&J, but you, you do talk about it a lot in other interviews. But I'm yeah. interested in something that didn't go well, like a failure that ended up being a valuable lesson that, that that turned into, um, you know, a, a success. Um, this wasn't really a failure, um, but I did learn a lot from it. And it was um, a play I wrote called In the Absence of Spring, which is also published through play scripts, um, which I actually wrote. I went back to Ithaca in 95 and on, actually this was after 95, I went back in 97 and sort of workshopped the play with students, which was so helpful. And that play, <laughs> there's a terrorist bombing of New York, of the subways of New York in that play. That's not what the play is about at all. Um, the play is very much about intimacy and in some ways, even though it's never mentioned about AIDS in a way. Um, but I needed a sort of umbrella of sort of a culture of, of fear of, sex being related to death or death being a kind of umbrella over this world. So, and it was very much based on the sort of, of Pan Am, which I was at Ithaca when that, those students in Syracuse were killed. And so it was all in that for me. And so we did it. The world premiere was in its signature in 2000. Second stage in New York wanted to do it in New York at their uptown space, the first play at their uptown space for new work, which they did. Between those two productions, September 11th happened, which totally changed people's view of the play. Um, and I remember going to see Ann Bogart, who's a real mentor of mine, 
she had just released her on directing book and she was doing a reading of it at drama bookshop. And she said, well, y'all have read the book. Are going to read the book. Let me read a chapter that's not in the book, which was called context. And it was, per it was literally the day before I started rehearsal, which was perfect because it was about how context changes writing. It just does. But that taught me that was a play. First of all, I was too close to it. I think it was a very personal play for me. And then when that happened, I should have just said someone else needs to direct this play because I'm just rewriting it right now to make it make sense in this moment. And that's not what the play is about. And I think if someone else had directed it, I may have talked about it. I may have not just tried to fix it. And so the original draft of that play was it was a three act sprawling kind of mess of a play. I was so influenced by like everyone was at the time by Angels in America, just like being crazy with what could happen on stage. And it ended up being a, a kind of much cleaner, tidier play. It's still ferocious, I think, but people would walk out it on, on it all the time at Signature. I mean, just walk out on it because they were offended by it, which now I'm like, people would, <laughs> would, would not even blink at it now. But um, so that was a big, a big lesson of just go with your gut. I've had many times of, even actually on Into the Woods, which I loved doing it that summer. And I'm so proud of that production. The cast was brilliant. And, and I think they completely reinvented those roles in ways. But I want, went against my instinct in terms of how I wanted to stage it conceptually. And even conceptually, how I wanted to lead, like guide the design. And I regret it because it's my one show I've always wanted to do and I want to do it again because the cast was brilliant and amazing. But I don't think it's my best work because I went against my instinct. Well, excellent. Well, it, with the subject of context, I think it's a great um, lead in. Indeed. Gloria, who directed the production of Walter Cron Cronkite is, is dead here in town. Um, that you know, the subject of the play, which was written in, in 2010, takes on, you know, a different perspective when it's performed in 2021. So Gloria, was, was that part of the discussions you had with your team and your cast? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first of all, it's great to meet you, Joe. You too. Thank you for this piece. I, I have to be honest, I had never read it before it was chosen by the uh, uh, theater's play reading committee. And it was chosen obviously for a number of reasons, had a small cast and we had to be cognizant of the COVID regulations. We could have like, I think based on the size of our stage, 4.4 .4 people on stage. That was like <laughs> one person on each side and two <laughs> on stage and so forth. But uh, it's come to be a really uh, fabulous experience for me personally. I've worked with two of our best actresses um, in our community theater company, Angela's over there. They have, you know, I always say as a director, until the words get in the mouths of the actors, I don't fully see it or it isn't fully realized, but this has been a great opportunity. I think it reverberates so incredibly clearly in 2021. It's, it's kind of eerie actually, yeah. you know? It's shocking in some ways yeah. how close it fits. I actually had because it's it's been it, it it's always been done here and there since the pandemic it's had its most productions in a close period of time than in a while which makes sense i do think partly initially people's they've been like oh it's two actresses perfect then you read it and you're like oh um i actually last week had the two original actresses who did it in the world premiere read it for me on zoom just because i hadn't heard it just to see how it read um, which was great. And I mean, the history of it's interesting. Those two characters were part of a much larger play of mine called, um, oh God, what was it called? <laughs> Holding Pattern, which was set in an airport. But that play, when it was originally written, I was actually, I, the Kennedy Center asked me to come. Well, I want, I, this is bizarrely how it happened. My brother-in-law is a producer and writer in radio. And he had done a piece, the only piece done in any media form of survivors from the Pentagon. And he had interviewed them and he had all these transcripts mm -hmm. and he sent them to me and said, do you want to do something with these? So I was like, I don't know what, but I, the, the, and a 
the literary manager at Signature said the Kennedy Center is looking for 9-11 pieces. So I called them, we did like a week workshop of reading through this stuff. But then I just started, we, because we were talking, I started writing other characters having nothing to do with these people. And I said it in an airport, but it was very much, this was pre 2008. So it was very much a kind of, there was a sort of Bush era play in terms of a little bit of paranoia and a kind of the world is um, coming into an end and planes are falling out of the sky. And um, so, and Signature agreed to do it. They were gonna do it. Then 2008 happened and the economy tanked and it was like nine character plays like we can't not afford to do a nine character play. I mean, now it's impossible unless you're, you know, Sarah Rule or Tony Kushner or someone. But um, so I was really like, ugh, my sister who's a writer was like, Joe, it's some of your best writing. And I was actually talking, I was down in Virginia and I was having lunch with the literary manager and first she said, you cannot let all that writing go. Like, who are your two favorite characters from it? And I said, these two women who had no interaction in the other play, none. And then we were also talking about the state of the world and how because Obama had been elected that she felt strongly. And I we were talking about the fact that civil discourse is like sort of crumbled. And she said, I think it's gonna get better. And I was like, I completely disagree. And I said, Walter Cronkite is dead after all. And I was like, <laughs> <What a great title. laughs> so by the end of that lunch, I literally, and I walked to the apartment I was sitting in, I walked past the artistic director said, I'm turning that play into a two character play for Sherry and Nancy. And it's gonna be called Walter Cronkite is Dead. And, and I wrote the first draft of that weekend. And now some of that, some of those monologues already, the Kennedy monologue I had written at the Kennedy Center. And, um, but it was a whole new play and that's how it happened. And and I still think it resonates because it's in some ways how we got here. Now I did talk to a director several years ago and she said, have you ever thought of updating that? I was like, I don't think you could update it nope. because I'm not sure because as again, it's amazing to think that at the time I wrote it thinking civil discourse is dead and like, the extremes have gotten to the extremes, which really did come from me partly, you know, I'm very progressive and very liberal, but I remember at the time thinking that I had friends, I'm like, we're just now throwing mud at each other. Like, I agree with your opinion, but how you're posting it on social media, to me is no different in tone than the side I don't agree with. So we have to figure out how to talk. I would say the extremes have gotten more extreme as they always do. And would these women even sit down? Oh, um, they would. Yes, they would. I agree with you because I actually, the two actresses, again, when, last week we did it and the actress um, playing Patty Aston is like, look, I actually don't think how I wrote her, I don't think she became a conspiracy theorist. I just don't. I mean, I wrote, I mean, that, her monologue about her son was the breakthrough for me. Cause it was like, I have to write something for her <clears throat> that I cannot disagree with. But when she is right. Mm. And that whole monologue about sitting on the edges of the country and you're, you know, that you can feel safe and not, you don't even know these people who are basically letting you live the life you're living. And I wrote that and it completely freed the play for me because I suddenly, knew her and understood her. And, and I wanted to write two women who were three-dimensional and both are flawed, but both have amazing qualities. And, you know. Yeah. I love Margaret when Patty talks about hope. To you know, she talks about, I had hope, I had hope. And I'm yeah. a real progressive liberal as well. Yeah. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, excuse me if I'm uh, being offensive, but when Trump first uh, became our president, I thought I can crawl in a hole or I can have some hope. Yeah, yeah. And see what happens, which was quickly for me personally um, blown away, but at any rate. And I, I mean, I guess you could that. argue, sorry, if you look into the future, that you could argue she could go either way dramaturgically, right. but I just don't. Anyway, it could never be set now. It just couldn't, you couldn't update it. I would have to write a completely new play. Right. Angela, Love as one of the lead um, actors, yeah. how, how do you describe this, this show? 
Well, it's a challenge because of all those lines, but um, aside from that, I, I, I play Margaret and I love, I love the way that Margaret really comes to, she expresses what's really needed here and that's understanding. And you uh, express that so well. I love the way the two characters are alike. Their children both have disappointed them. Their religions have failed them in one way or another. And as a <clears throat> lapsed Catholic, mm -hmm. um, you know, it really resonated with your her whole speech about how uh, the Catholic Church really failed her. Really um, resonated. That yes. is the very first thing I wrote because when we were at the Kennedy Center, the actress who ended up being the actress who did the premiere talked about her, it, it, the story of it's completely different. And that is in some ways based on a priest who was in Rochester, who, who had this kind of amazing congregation and then sort of disappeared. But, um, and I went to a wedding of a friend's and she walked down the aisle to the Peanuts theme. So that is, wow. <laughs> and her last name, and anyway, so, um, <laughs> But, but this actress, she talked about it. And so I wrote that, that's the very first writing of the play. I wrote it at the Kennedy Center. Um, uh, it's maybe actually really the only writing that happened at the Kennedy Center, but, um, but it was freeing to be like, oh, this can be a whole, this is, this is not gonna be a piece of documentary theater. This is gonna be a whole new thing. So um, yeah, and I think too, like, you know, I, I, I really appreciate, I mean, it's, it's interesting to write a thing surprise you. Like when I was like, I thank God for my acting training all the time. One is a director, because I feel like I have more empathy in the audition room and the rehearsal room. And I think I understand, you know, the glitches that happen and I I'm, I'm, hope I'm more empathetic. And as a writer, like that's why I'm most an actor again, because I have to be in it. And I remember the surprises in this play were but I don't like my children. That, I remember writing a line and we was like, oh. <laughs> it surprised me. But I was in her mindset and that came out. And I, I think in some ways that monologue resonates more about the gifts her children have given her, um, the spoils of war. I don't think that registered, especially the stuff about that she has a mirror from <laughs> Saddam's palaces in her home. Um, and obviously, I mean, I told the story about wanting to go to Berlin, that obviously that was um, altered, but that certainly was part of it because it was such an impactful time for me. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I love them both. And I also, I love that when Patty says what she says to her daughter um, and that Margaret hears it and doesn't judge her for it. And that's when I wrote too, like her saying, how do you change all you've been taught? Whether we agree about what she has been taught, like it's, people are human beings and I don't, and I'm gay and I don't hate her for that line. I completely understand her saying it and her struggle with it to me is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And her daughter was not particularly helpful. <laughs> like I, I say this to friends all the time. I'm like, cause my parents were very, 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 supportive of me coming out. And so in college, when I would have friends come out and be like, my parents aren't like yours. I'm like, guess what? You need to give them time. Like, I feel grateful that I never saw. I remember a boyfriend at the time who came out and, and he had a, and his parents, I mean, they ended up being very loving about it, but it was rough for a while. I remember talking to my mother and saying, you know, it's, it's tough for him right now. His parents, um, aren't very accepting. It wasn't easy for them like it was for you. Pause, pause, pause. And she said, it wasn't easy. And I realized how much love that was for them to never show me that of course it's a struggle, especially this was like the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. I do wanna say though that I love hearing these Ithaca stories because my son is also an Ithaca grad 2013 in musical composition. And I am, it was a great choice for him in part, a large, a, 
and uh, the connections that you make, the connections that you make in those colleges <laughs> that, sure. that Patty talks about. And Ithaca is a, is a great example for the, of that. Um, and I also think as a, when you're talking about your own experiences as a writer and how you incorporate that into your writing and then you alter it, I think that's, that is the alchemy of writing that is so interesting. So kudos to you for being able to do that. I do it all the time. There's a lot of very personal things in my plays, whether it's stuff about me or um, certainly how Margaret talks about when things like, I mean, my, my mother was a, a 50s teenager and, you know, there, I have photos of her in white gloves. Dior and white gloves and she knew how to hold a cigarette and, Right. You know, I, she would look stunning because people just look and she was 17 because people just looked better then because <laughs> they dressed the part. Um, so there's a, and they were actually dedicated the play to my mother for that reason. She luckily saw a reading of the play. She passed before the pr first production, but I, it was very much a play for her. Um, there's so much of her and actually both characters. In oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually, I, I had wondered about that because I, did take note of the dedication. And I thought, oh, I bet his mother was like Margaret, but now you say it was both characters. So that's interesting to me. Certainly her, I think her political bent is Margaret, but her kind of like warmth and being and like, and not judging people is pure Patty. And, um, and she didn't come from a ton of money. And so there's, so she's in both of them, both of them. She, She's in both of them, yeah. Mm. And she was obsessed with the Kennedys, I'll also say that. She didn't have her <laughs> children after them, but she was, they were both, my parents were diehard Kennedy Democrats, like full on Camelot, the whole thing. <laughs> my mother, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, my parents, too, yeah. <laughs> So before we um, wrap up, is there any changes, um, Gloria and Angela, that were that you made to to the written script for for the day? No, oh, we don't change that. No, not the script, but I watch the script. <laughs> no, but uh -huh. Gloria, do you want to talk about other things that you've done? Yeah, well, you know, we had two. We had a choice here about uh, we did it inside and outside. This little theater company has never done an outside production, so. Uh, we had to come up with um, a way to, the actresses have to change their blocking stylistically a little bit because they're on a platform where when they're on the main stage, they have much more room and there's no spectacle. I've taken it, Joe, into the absurdist kind of arena a little bit. Okay. And so when we're inside, all the inner monologues when they're storytelling are represented through, we've made some films and we've done a I series of projections. So. We actually have an, a, a fabulous Amalfi film that we have an actor from our company come in who plays Vittorio and the women are in it. And I don't I know, we we'll on to Hollywood, I'm sure. But anyway, <laughs> and then we did a whole montage with the Kennedys and, and we allow Patty and uh, to see Margaret's storytelling. So she reacts to them when she sees them on the screen mm -hmm. and it's a ghost story. We did the whole exorcist thing. We've had a <laughs> lot of fun. We've done- Love it. Um, glass hallway. We've done the breaking of the mirror and Margaret's, um, you know, my eye. And so a lot of, so they're two different shows. So when you go outside, it's pure comedy and fun and emotion. Yeah. And, and the women just are, it's, they're so special and wonderful. And the audience was hysterically laughing and then quiet, quiet, near tears and crying at moments outside and then inside it's just craziness and we just love <laughs> i loved it it gave me a lot of material no, i love it creatively play with but we never mm. change it a word of what yeah. the playwright gives us that's yeah. sacrosanct that's i actually may without I, I may do a rewrite on it um one thing well i don't want to talk about it while you're still doing it because i think it all works <laughs> i just there's um there's one particular change that I just want to alter um, that stuck with me for a while of feeling like, mm, again, it's not big. Tell it's me just, at some point, I'll be too curious to live without knowing. Yes. Yeah, uh, a great I'll, director once said, friend, and then she can yeah. tell me sometime. Yeah. Yes, or, or we can just zoom about it. I just don't want to yeah, either hear about it while you're in the midst of production because 
right. Yeah. Um, it's a great piece. We've thank you. I'm I I I'm very I have great affection for it. So mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up. I I think it was I loved seeing the show, although I saw it outside, and now I feel like I have to go in and see all the the film footage. Um, Love that. I will say, Angela, we can tell you're the actress because of your Zoom lighting, dark, <laughs> so lit beautifully. Um, and and Joe, I like the way your shirt coordinates with yeah, that. Thank well, you. I, uh, yes, I, I worked on that. <laughs> and another gentleman we went to Ithaca with is a successful music editor in Hollywood, Angela. So if your son needs a, needs a connection, let, it, let us know. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you. And was was watching silently. She's a screenwriter out in LA. And um, we have a lot of writers in our community. And I think it's a great value for them to listen to giving the time for you to discover new things. I think everybody goes at it with their head. And Joe, it's obvious that you go at it with your your heart in every every piece of it. And it's just lovely to get to talk to you about that. So if anybody's interested, um, Walter Cronkite is dead, is running for another weekend or two? Another weekend. We have four more performances. Four more performances, inside and out. Mm -hmm. uh, Theater of Manchester at Cheney Hall. Um, if you're interested in the visual arts, our Juneteenth exhibit, we have over 20 local artists, an amazing um, collection here, definitely worth seeing. Uh, and we always welcome submissions from local artists. We consider local to be, you know, Manchester and the rest of New England. Uh, sometimes someone from New York uh, slips in. And um, yeah, we're, we're just really trying to support arts and culture to bring community together again, to witness um, these ideas and thoughts and personal experiences, reflect them through our lens, talk about them with other people. And it's a great thing to have work like Joe's exhibited, exhibited in town. So on that note, we're gonna end. I will uh, be posting this uh, YouTube and sharing the link for you all to share and just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Send me, Congratulations. Send me production shots. Uh -oh. you, send me production yeah. shots if oh, you have them. Some great ones. Yeah, great. yeah, yeah. Fabulous. We will all right. take that. Perfect. Thanks so much. This Yay. is great. Thanks a lot, guys. See you all. Bye, all. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye Sharon. <laughs>